now. It was a really good surprise for me when he accept uh, our invitation. And, I, and at the beginning, I just uh, invite him to be part of our course on uh, building material. But since he accepted this invitation, we decided with uh, I encourage that to make it the event for all the university, I mean, all the uh, uh, Department of Architecture, for all of you to get the knowledge of uh, Professor Brunel on uh, materials and innovation with building materials. So to have uh, Professor Brunel here to speak about it, He's also the author of the several books of, on innovative materials that are very inspiring and also uh, write uh, regular columns on uh, the Architect magazine uh, that's uh, quite interesting that I've been reading and following him since a uh, few years and I was really happy to read these columns and that's how the idea of inviting him came. So thanks a lot to be here. And please, we are happy to listen to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks Thank you, much. Matthew. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you at the beginning of your uh, start of the academic uh, term. And uh, it's, it's been a very strange year for all of us, I think. Uh, but uh, one of the positive, one of the benefits of us being uh, online most, much of the time is that uh, we can do things like this. And uh, I really appreciate your kind uh, and generous invitation to join you uh, in a place I have not been. I have not been to Izmir and, uh, or Turkey in general yet, uh, but it's a place that I've, I've long wanted to visit and uh, hopefully uh, with, with luck, we'll be able to visit uh, maybe even next year. Uh, we, have a, we have a Rome study abroad program that we're trying to expand uh, to include some uh, visits in Turkey. So we'll, we'll be in touch, see if, see if we can actually meet up at, at some sometime in the future safely. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, my talk uh, about material agency in a way that uh, starts with a personal story. Uh, so I, I think it helps to understand where, where does my interest come from? Where does the interest in materials and architecture come from? As a student, I, I have a couple of images here uh, from my experiences as an undergraduate student in architecture. And uh, on the left uh, is, is a drawing from one of my architecture studios. And on the right is uh, an image uh, of a type of activity that I experienced in building technology. Now, I'm not familiar with uh, the uh, academic curriculum at your university. So I can only speak about my own experience. But in the United States, in a lot of universities, design studio education uh, is, it has been uh, primarily interested in and focused on form and composition and um, uh, proportions and uh, relationships to site and program. I mean, there are many, many important things uh, but material, the, the focus on materials is not always one of the primary areas of emphasis in design studio education, uh, traditionally speaking. And so on the left, you see a diagram that we, we're not even sure what materials <laughs> my, my museum project was going to be made of. Uh, whereas on the right, uh, building technology, in my experience, has been taught as its own uh, particular path, its own curricular component. And uh, in building technology, it, it's very much focused on current 
technologies and best practices. So on the left, you have, in my experience, uh, an academic environment where uh, students are expected to be original thinkers from the start uh, without too much background uh, and without much knowledge of physical realities yet. Uh, whereas on the right, uh, if you know, building technology, building science, students are not expected to be original thinkers. They're expected to learn rules, learn how things go together uh, and, and uh, to, be, uh, to be concrete, to be very focused on uh, regulations and, and health and safety. And that's all, that's all fine, but it's interesting to me that the two are very distinct to learning. And in my experience in practice, this, this type of uh, dual thinking uh, continues to persist. And so these are some examples on, on the left was a project. These are just examples, right? Uh, when I was a young architect working at a firm, uh, I worked in, at a firm in Seattle called NBBJ, corporate commercial firm. And this was uh, a hypothetical development project, mixed use project uh, for Seattle. It's uh, located at the south end of Lake Union in the middle of Seattle. Uh, kind of a similar situation where we're just looking at floor area ratios, we're looking at buildable, buildable envelopes, relationships to the site, massing, there's some indication of green roofs, green areas, but we really don't know what materials or, or you know, what the rules are, so to speak, in terms of the building components. Uh, whereas on the right, we know that ultimately anything we build has to have a material, has to assume material form and has to uh, abide by physics and, and those material rules. And so for me, this kind of disconnect, if you will, persists even in practice where we may not think much about materials at the beginning of a project. So at this time, uh, when I was just out of graduate school, uh, and this was in 1999, 2000, so a little bit, oh, <laughs> a couple of decades ago, uh, there, there became a very uh, in, intensified interest in new materials and new methods of application. And uh, architecture firms like Karen Timberlake uh, and, and uh, those partners wrote a book called uh, Refabricating Architecture. Uh, we're really intrigued with all of the new materials, all the new building products that architects could use as part of their palette. Uh, there was a firm in New York I'm sure we're familiar with called Material Connection that, that had just launched uh, previously. So there became this really real interest in new materials, innovative materials. Uh, I, was, I was in a similar, uh, I had a similar interest in a firm I, where I worked in the city of Houston where we were looking at a pro an important public project and the project architect asked me to research new materials. And it was, it was the first time I had done so. And I quickly became fascinated with the vast number and variety of possibilities in, in the material landscape, so to speak, product landscape. Uh, many, of, many of these things architects didn't even know about. And so that's partly uh, a kind of mission I found for myself is to find out more information about new materials and to try to, uh, to filter that information and curate that information for architects and, and students and designers. And uh, as an outgrowth of that effort, I was very interested in how materials would be applied. And these are some images that, are, uh, that, that appear in a couple of books that I wrote after the Transmaterial series uh, material strategies is one title. Another one is Matter in the Floating World. And these books were attempts to, uh, to capture different strategies of using new materials or new material thinking 
in the built environment. Because it's one thing to have really fascinating new products, uh, but quite another to look at the innovation in the design process. And just still some more about personal background. Uh, I've, I've become a champion of writing about uh, and critiquing material related issues. So I've, as Matthew mentioned, I've been writing for Architect Magazine uh, since 2009, uh, because I think it's important that uh, there, there's so many complicated choices that architects have to make uh, regarding new materials and or material applications, uh, regulations, uh, resource concerns, you know, sustainability concerns that uh, this is this is kind of a regular uh, form of advocacy for me is to write about these things. So just just to step back for a minute, when we think about materials, uh, which which I think we do uh, frequently, if not if not uh, you know daily uh, in design, it helps to uh, to think in a very uh, conceptual way about the purpose of materials. And one way that I have attempted to describe uh, what materials do is that they they help to manifest our ideas, right? So uh, architecture in built form requires material substance. And so uh, one way I've described architecture is the fulfillment of a spatial premise uh, using materials. So a, a spatial premise in our minds, you know, a conceptual idea about space. Uh, materials are the ingredients to, to make that a possibility in the world. And when we look at the history of architecture, we see an inseparable marriage between uh, material innovation and, and architecture as a field. Uh, certainly there are many types of innovation, but uh, one predominant form that we see is, is that of material technology. And we frequently refer to uh, canonical buildings like the Pantheon, in this case, for its engineering innovation of this tremendously long span and concrete uh, that was not surpassed for centuries. And certainly in contemporary modern and, and contemporary works, uh, we see this pattern and historian Richard Weston uh, in describing the canon in architecture says, the bias has been towards those buildings that were innovative stylistically, technically, or programmatically, and especially those that significantly affected the course of architecture. So often, not always, but often, when we refer to important precedents for our students and even for us, for our self practice, oftentimes those precedents have characteristics. Uh, they're, they're marked by new material ideas and experiments. So I'll talk a little bit more about the role of innovation. Innovation is a, um, it's a word that we use a lot, but a word that I think requires more definition. It's, it's a very uh, abstract word. <laughs> I think it's a very imprecise word. So again, stepping back to think broadly. So why innovate and, and who innovates? Uh, so the top image here is intended to be the academy. Uh, our institutions of higher learning and scholarship. So your university, for example, or mine. There is a mission uh, that we have to make an original and substantial contribution to our discipline. Uh, this is the expectation of, of any, any faculty with research uh, uh, responsibilities, right? Any scholarship, we're expected to make original contributions. And the same goes for students in, in their own way in courses. Uh, every assignment, we expect our students to do something 
to make some contribution, right? It may be, it may be small, it depends on the type of assignment, uh, but certainly a dissertation, a PhD is certainly an original and significant contribution is what we expect. So this is innovation. This is, this is part of our job description and expectations when we're faculty or students. In the marketplace, the middle image, uh, we could define innovation as a kind of imperative for companies to constantly, uh, for one thing, survive, uh, but to also compete and succeed in the marketplace, right? And innovation could be incremental or it could be, uh, it could be disruptive. It could really make bold changes, but uh, innovation is kind of a daily reality for most businesses. And then the last image at the bottom is just a representation of an environmental calamity shot by Edward Bertensky, the photographer. Uh, but the, the, the important uh, point here is to do things like solve wicked problems, right? Solve grand challenges. So in the world, we have, we have many uh, environmental and societal problems that require innovative solutions. So innovation, I'm, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to make the argument that innovation is not some kind of optional fringe exercise, but rather a kind of everyday uh, challenge and opportunity for all of us. So when we look at the arts and sciences and the design arts, we could pinpoint examples of innovation. We could, we could invite our friends and family members to refer to examples of innovation. Uh, let's say in lighting design on the left or in the middle, uh, a scientific laboratory or, or an engineering experiment, let's say, or on the right here, uh, a concept car, you know, in, in let's say the automotive arena. Uh, I think when we ask, uh, not only architects, but non-architects, what, what would you say, what would you say are some examples of innovation? They might pick some of these examples, right? Uh, of how various disciplines related to architecture, but none of these are architecture specifically, are advancing their own fields uh, through bold experiments, trying to push the envelope. But when it comes to architecture, something very strange happens. Uh, this is an article that appeared in the New York Times newspaper uh, a few years ago, but it's just, it's representative of uh, the kind of mixed attitudes about architecture. And in this case, conservatism about what architecture should and can be. And uh, this, I'll just paraphrase, I'll try to explain the story. Uh, this particular article was uh, an opinion editorial piece that was a criticism of modern and contemporary building, especially, uh, you know, the modern style, modern materials being used for housing. And you can see a cartoon, uh, there's, it's a depiction of the architect wearing the yellow jacket, uh, proudly displaying his new uh, modern house prototypes or modern neighborhood and his friend is longingly looking at the traditional looking birdhouse. <laughs> so, and uh, a, a quote, I've just excerpted a quote here. Uh, to Stephen, an architect, this model for affordable housing, a tough pair of stacked boxes sheathed in corrugated metal was a bold design statement but to his mother's eye, the house was a blight on the landscape, an insult to its historic neighbors. And so we have this problem and challenge in architecture in that uh, in, this, in, the, in the case of material innovation where there's evidence of new material experiments, uh, there's a large audience for architecture that does not want this. <laughs> They don't want this innovation. Uh, it's not that every building has to have metal and glass to be innovative, far from it. But uh, this is an interesting question, right? If we were to look at the car industry, if cars, if, if, uh, 
if a car manufacturer started to to fabricate uh, horse and buggy carriages uh, today, uh, they would be laughed at. But the equivalent in building is often what clients want. Not always, <laughs> but often what they want is a, is a horse and buggy. And it, there's a really interesting history uh, that, that we've seen over time. Even those projects, even those precedents that we hold up as marvels of their time uh, and, and, and kind of part of history, uh, like, like the Gothic cathedral on the far left, uh, we see moments where when architecture makes bold progress that's evident in its material construction and its visible form uh, through that construction, uh, that it's, it's often difficult for society, especially at first, to, uh, to welcome these projects. Even the Gothic style uh, was hated by many uh, as being monstrous in its appearance. I think it's something we don't think much about today. Or the middle image of uh, the architect Gaudi and the Sagrada Familia, uh, for example, Gaudi was reviled by many. He, he, he was thought to be sort of this crazy, uh, architect making these ugly uh, st structures that were incredibly structurally innovative, uh, but really uh, not, you know, not appreciated broadly, or or at least not uniformly appreciated. And then, of course, the Pompidou Center behind me here on the right uh, was uh, famously hated by many Parisians. Uh, when it first opened, in fact, uh, on, on one of the opening days uh, when Rogers was present, one of the architects was present on site, uh, an old woman attacked him with her cane because she was so angry <laughs> at, the, at this project. And so whatever you think about these buildings, it's just really interesting that uh, architecture and perhaps because it's so significant in our experience and relatively static or relatively permanent uh, compared with an automobile let's say or compared with uh, some uh, an article of clothing someone might wear or an electronic device someone might carry uh, whatever the reason uh, society has has a less uh, welcoming uh, approach sometimes or perhaps often to new ideas in terms of material construction and architecture. It's, it's, it's rare that uh, you would have this kind of uh, large segment of society being so upset about a new car on the street, right? Uh, or someone wearing a new type of clothing. Uh, but in architecture, there is this segment of society that often is present. And yet, when you look at material technologies and how they have changed over time, it's remarkable and it's easily evident that we can see that material advancement requires experimentation. Uh, think about windows before glass. I mean, the Romans used window glass in, sparingly in a few buildings, it's very expensive. Uh, but before that, we had. We just had punched openings, so to speak, these kind of exposed openings of buildings that we'd have to cover with, uh, with animal skins uh, or textiles of various kinds or paper. And, and eventually we have uh, a more and more sophisticated uh, type of glazing technology in, in the middle image. And then of course, today we have highly intricate complex uh, and uh, you know, very, very sophisticated technical solutions to glazing that can take a variety of forms. And so it, if we could look at any element of architecture like this, like aperture design or glazing and see over time rapid or, or, or not rapid, but uh, marvelous advances, but these advances require actual work, right? They require application and testing 
over many generations. So I wanna look more deeply at uh, technology and architecture and, and application and how technology, uh, you know, different ways to think about how, how technology is applied. So the media scholar, uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, often talked about technology with regard to kind of cultural environments or mediated environments. And I'll uh, read this quotation here. Our typical response to a disrupting new technology is to recreate the old environment instead of heeding the new opportunities of the new environment. And here by environment, again, it's a kind of cultural attitude, right? Or media environment. Failure to notice the new opportunities is also failure to understand the new powers. This failure leaves us in the role of mere automata or robots, you know, passively going about our lives. So uh, what he's saying is, is just interpreting is when you have new technologies, often they require new thinking. We don't quite know what to do at first. Uh, and creative thinking is often welcomed. This is an image that I included of uh, a new type of roof shingle that's, or it's a roof shingle that's made of a new type of uh, polymer for uh, obviously for residential roofs. And uh, you can see that this, this shingle has been molded to look like slate. And very intentionally, this is a kind of skeuomorph. If you've heard of this term, a skeuomorph is to take an old, uh, an old familiar form and the new technology conforms to that old familiar form so that people can accept it. Now this new polymer could take any number of forms. It could be uh, something very unlike a slate shingle. And yet presumably this manufacturer thought it would be most accepted in the marketplace if it hid itself <laughs> and disguised itself as, an old, as a more familiar material. And we have this throughout the built environment. Uh, it's, it's a kind of lying actually, we might say, or, or at least conformity better way to put it. Uh, but this would be an example of, of I think, uh, of a new technology simply recreating the old environment. Well, new technologies uh, can be described in different ways. And to use the term disruptive technology from McLuhan and then, uh, and, uh, then the, the business uh, scholar, Clayton Christensen, who coined the term disruptive innovation, a disruptive technology is one like, this is a, 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 a as you probably can tell immediately, uh, a close up image of an LED light. Uh, a disruptive technology is one that does not, it does not create small incremental steps of uh, kind of success in a micro, in a marketplace. Rather, it rapidly advances in its competition with other products because it offers uh, capacities that can products simply cannot match. This is a, an image, this is a photograph that I took in the Bruck Lighting Showroom at, in Los Angeles uh, in 2000 of an LED. This is one of my first LED lights to see. And the president of Bruck Lighting at the time said, he pointed and said, this will be the future. This is going to be the future light. It's this small not very bright kind of blue light at the time, but he was absolutely right. Uh, LEDs now dominate a, a very large proportion of the, of the market share in lighting as we know. Um, and they brought many new capacities that other light forms did not have um, like uh, incandescent and fluorescent uh, lights could not compete with the the color rendering index options and, and advances with the, the lower levels of heat, with the control uh, capabilities, and also the energy, low energy capabilities of LEDs. So imagine 2000 LEDs had 0% of the place. 
in lighting and now it's over half. I'm not sure what it is now, but it's, it's a huge amount of change, huge amount of change in a very short period of time. So this is what we might call disruptive technology. Now, in terms of application, uh, here's, here's one example that architects could apply a new technology, is to take that new technology and apply it in new ways. And so in 2008, this was a fairly new way to apply LEDs in buildings. Uh, this is Simone Giostra's Green Pix facade at the time of the Beijing Summer Olympics, uh, which was solar energy harvesting, so zero energy and uh, LEDs that are integrated into these glazing units uh, create, uh, could create uh, live uh, real-time video effects, multicolor effects, uh, uh, you know, continuously throughout the night. So this is, th this is quite an interesting new application idea for this new technology. But it's important to note that in, in my view, new applications can also happen with existing technologies. And uh, this is one of my favorite tea houses and not like any traditional tea house that I think we're familiar with, the Japanese tea house. Uh, this is designed by Kengo Kuma. When I first saw the image on the right, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. I didn't understand it. It looked like a, uh, I'm not sure, sort of just a cloud. <laughs> this atmosphere, this fog of material, I wasn't sure what it was. Uh, and, and looks luminous and mysterious and, and quite intriguing. Uh, this installation was made from simple and expensive plastic sheeting. You can see the detail on the left is this kind of opalescent uh, polycarbonate sheeting. Uh, so the tea house is made, it's, it's constructed kind of like a topographic model on its side, right? Uh, where we're, we're seeing those layers. But until we understand that, it's quite a new experience, I think. And uh, plastic sheeting is not that old, but my point is that it's an off the shelf product. It's not a disruptive technology necessarily, but we can still as architects uh, <clears throat> create new experiences, right? Uh, we, can, we can do new things with materials that, that, uh, that might also be uh, very inexpensive and very accessible. So just, just to uh, add a little bit to the kind of theoretical uh, foundations of these ideas, uh, the theorist Stanford Quinter has said, the technical concept of singularities refers to those critical points or moments within a system when its qualities and not just its quantities undergo a fundamental change. And I believe that this quote relates to this notion of a kind of disruptive thinking or an innovative thinking in application. And as a way to illustrate this point, I'm, use, I'm showing another Kengo Kuma project where he, it, he has specified a masonry wall uh, in this building. This is obviously a close-up detail. And as you can see, the masonry kind of morphed morphs from the right to the left to become more and more porous and more, uh, it seems more vulnerable, more tenuous, uh, because it, it appears that the, that the masonry blocks are moving from compression to take on more and more tension in, their, in, in terms of how they bear loads and transfer loads. Uh, this is a little bit of a trick because Kuma is using steel plates chevron shaped steel plates that are very thin and concert with these uh, stone blocks to carry the load of this wall. So he's, he's playing a trick of the eye with the steel plates. But the point is that this is, a, this is a critical point or moment within a system where the architect is changing the qualities, is purposely resituating the material language. And so, I'd like to offer 
five different strategies that I, th th these are strategies that I tracked for the book material strategies that I became fascinated with seeing that a lot of architects employ these various strategies at one point or another uh, to bring about new material ideas or new applications in architecture. For each of these strategies, and the first one here is to push limits, I will, I will discuss three elements. Uh, the project of discussion is on the right. So this is uh, Shigeru Ban's paper tower that he designed for London, the London Design Festival in 2009. So this is the main project. But as part of thinking about the project, I will talk about a kind of um, available material. Uh, and, and this is the primary palette used. And so paper tubes on the upper left were that available material the architect chose to use. And then on the lower left, I will talk about a kind of precedent, a kind of existing precedent of a structure. And so uh, this paper tower is one example of how, and I think we're very familiar with Shigeru Ban's use of paper tubes, uh, a very bold, unusual decision on his on his part to try to use a widely available, very inexpensive, and generally thought to be fairly weak material uh, for bold structures like like the paper tower. Uh, it, it does it does have steel joints. It has steel connections. Uh, but pay, only paper spans between those connections. And we've seen this architect create incredible vault structures and roof structures out of paper tubes. Um, and this idea that he can make a strong structure out of weak material. So this is fascinating. Uh, so this is an example in this case of pushing limits, right? Pushing structural limits, but also pushing what's culturally acceptable in terms of limits, right? Uh, his his pavilion for the Hanover Expo uh, required the use of additional reinforcing because the engineers just didn't feel comfortable with the paper, <laughs> even though even though their calculations showed that it would carry the roof, they just didn't feel comfortable with it. And so this is clearly pushing limits when you're going beyond people's comfort range. Uh, so the precedent in this case might have been something like a steel utility tower for this tower. We're not sure. I'm, I don't know that Bond was looking at this type of tower, but, but that's what's culturally acceptable, right? And then to take a new material and apply it in a, in a, a like fashion, a similar fashion, but with this new material definitely pushes what's expected that, that this material can do. The next type of trend uh, is trying to describe what happens when one kind of language, one kind of component language in a building uh, subsumes another or merges with another component language. So you start to see components in architecture uh, merge and assimilate into one another. And the example I would include here is a project by Shuhei Endo uh, on, on the right, this house, which is, you can see uh, it, its primary material expression is that of corrugated steel. And the architect is using the corrugated steel in an unusual way. The precedent for, in terms of using corrugated steel on the lower left might be to say, we need a roof with corrugated steel and then walls have to look a certain way. and and the flooring looks a certain way, and it's built a certain way. Uh, but Endo is very interested and inspired by Japanese calligraphy uh, and the idea of a type of calligraphy called renmentai, where the brush does not leave the paper when you write. And so this is his version of corrugated steel not leaving the paper. So that it traces a roof and becomes a wall and becomes a floor and it becomes a wall on the roof, uh, which, which is very interesting, uh, innovative use, very unconventional use of this material. But when we think about its structural capacities, uh, this profiling allows for the material uh, 
to work well in this, you know, taking on this kind of form. The third strategy is perhaps the most fascinating to me, and that is a balance between what architects choose to reveal and what they choose to conceal. And every architect is different. Uh, but I encourage, I encourage all of us, look, look more closely at some of our favorite projects to, to really uh, interrogate the projects based on this strategy. What is revealed and what is concealed? The project I'm looking at here is uh, Tadao Ando's Chichu Art Museum on Naoshima Island. The image on the right is of a courtyard space. It's an exterior courtyard. It's maybe three stories high. And there's something very strange about the wall of this courtyard that you might uh, notice if you, and perhaps you visited this building, uh, which, which is that the, this large expanse of concrete wall appears to be floating above this incision uh, and with no clear evidence of vertical loads being carried to the ground. And so this is very interesting. Ando is showing us a lot about concrete that many buildings don't show us or many architects don't show us. He loves to show us the evidence of concrete's construction, right? Uh, it's a very bold move because you can't have any mistakes. I mean, this is this is the this is fair face concrete, right? But we're seeing evidence of the construction. It's not coated with stucco or tile or anything covering up mistakes. And so, on the upper left image uh, is is of concrete formwork and form ties. Ando wants to reveal all of these things. He wants to reveal the formwork. He wants to reveal the form ties. But what he's concealing is indicated in the lower left. He's concealing clear load paths. Uh, and I, I ask that you look around and look at in you know, your neighborhoods and some of your favorite buildings. Uh, almost always we'll see evidence of clear load paths. So this is, you ha he had to go out of his way to cantilever these walls with no obvious columns uh, to make this gesture. Now, is this a gesture for every building? Maybe not, uh, but it's, it's a fascinating combination of, of, uh, of approaches to say, I'm gonna show you so much about what's happening, the internal workings of this wall but at the same time, I'm going to hide something very and, and make you feel very uncomfortable <laughs> and perform a little bit of magic. The next approach relates to that one. It has to do with uh, surprise, surprising audiences. And surprise can be something that is uh, shocking, but it can also be something that's just a little bit amusing or, or sparking curiosity. Uh, so Kinga Kuma once said uh, in a conversation uh, that uh, architecture has to be a little bit unreal. And I said, well, and, and, and he said, uh, architecture has to be a little bit unreal to be real. And I said, well, I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. Why does it have to be unreal? And he said, because if something is a little bit unreal, then you notice it and it becomes part of your consciousness. And if, and if you don't notice it, it might as well not exist. And so surprise can be many things. Uh, this, this project I'm showing is an installation uh, that I did uh, at the University of Michigan using recycled beverage containers. So we took all these waste you know, trash and, and recycled uh, beverage containers and created a kind of luminous LED wall with uh, programmable LED nets uh, to kind of breathe and cycle on and off in different colors uh, to create an, a kind of immersive environment. But it, at first glance, one might, one may not have known what is this material? I don't understand what I'm looking at. And that, I think, really is the surprise is then on closer discovery, notice that all those, all those kind of 
complex forms in the thermoform uh, mold of these bottles became great light refractors, right? And, and, and maybe, maybe there was a little bit of surprise in realizing what the material was. Uh, but it doesn't matter if it's this project or another one. I think that surprise though is, is something to consider when we're designing uh, and, and the way that Kuma thinks about it, right? To make something noticeable, to make something inspire curiosity, I think is the important thing. Otherwise we create spaces that just go unnoticed. And the last strategy is is it also applies to other things like writing and and art and science uh, activities and that is to edit right is is really to uh, focus our priorities on the material language that we're trying to convey and to eliminate extraneous information extraneous materials and the japanese firm sana is very very well known at this work. Uh, they will fight hard to eliminate <laughs> uh, any extraneous information from their from their buildings, uh, like this uh, retail store in Tokyo on the right. Uh, when I was a young architect, I I quickly learned that if you don't tell the contractor. Uh, exactly where you want to put outlets and switch plates and or where sprinkler heads are going to go or anything that you can you can quickly lose control of the editing <laughs> of the editing of your project all of these things are important you know for for safety and and delivering services right to architecture but it's important that we stay in control of of the design process so uh if those are strategies, then the next question is, well, so what? Well, what then what will happen? What are we trying to achieve? What, what is the purpose of these strategies? Why would we do any of this stuff? And these effects I'm trying to share, uh, start in a kind of small and immediate scale, uh, the scale of the human body and moving gradually and generally up in scale towards the scale of the city and beyond in terms of the effects that these uh, that material innovation can have. And so the first type of effect we might call a sensory effect. So just like with that surprise uh, that one can have in a new space, a new kind of discovery, or like this discovery in the Salon Lexus, which <laughs> must have been, quite remarkable, uh, Tokujin Yoshioka's uh, uh, anterior space that was composed of thousands of fiber optic strands that just look like this kind of thick rain or thick fog. Uh, but whatever it might be, right, it's, it's this ability to change the senses, to kind of capture the curiosity of the viewer, the user, uh, to, to spark some, some kind of element of consciousness. And it can be visual, it can be auditory, it can be tactile, right? But, but connecting, making that human connection uh, with first time visitors. The next set of effects uh, that I'll talk about have to do with systems. And so this is where things like renewable energy become important, uh, where we're using material innovation to uh, provide uh, new or, or perhaps simply just welcome uh, innovations in, in how we live, how we use spaces. This is the facade of uh, a parking garage in Nagoya, Japan. And the facade is called the Eco Curtain. And it's composed, you can see, of vertical wind turbines that are painted different colors, different sides. And uh, these, in concert with uh, solar PV panels, provide all the power for this building and, and uh, provide power to a shopping center adjacent to this parking structure. And I, I think what a great uh, uh, approach to the design of a parking structure. Often parking structures are, they don't, there's not that much that we expect 
their facades, you know, <laughs> especially if they're open air because uh, they have to ventilate. And so, uh, the, you know, it's often kind of uh, a mediocre uh, design project. Uh, but in this case, it's it's really represents a kind of fusion of art and science in a way that uh, the whole facade is now capturing wind. And we can now see the wind throughout the day as these turn at different rates of speed uh, and have a different relationship maybe with the wind. And then the colors change throughout the day. So it's a, it's a dynamic engaging kind of urban statement uh, when, when it could easily have just been a static statement. Material technologies also invite uh, different behavioral effects potentially, right? This is one kind of set of effects that ma new material applications can have. Returning to the architect Shigeru Ban, I love this curtain wall house in Tokyo, uh, in part because of the, the term curtain wall. It's, it, this is literally a wall that's a curtain as opposed to a glass curtain wall, which is usually what we mean when we say that term. Uh, this is an example of a type of architecture that required a different or requires a different set of behaviors of its occupants than maybe typical, right? Uh, so there are a couple of layers here. The other layer we can't see. Uh, there are screens that enclose that smaller, uh, smaller set of spaces on the interior. You can see in these, I don't know, if, I can't really point the right way, but <laughs> you can see these kind of tracks in, in this, uh, in the set of interior spaces can be enclosed for inclement weather or if it's really cold. But imagine if you will, every morning when the weather is nice, you wake up and you get dressed and then you open your curtains uh, and you have this incredibly a uh, tactile relationship with the envelope of your building, right? <laughs> to move these huge curtains and all of a sudden you have a completely exposed house. Uh, this, is, this is an unusual house, but I wanted to talk about behavioral effects because often a new material technology or a new material application can, can influence our behavior, right? It can influence how we interact with architecture. And at a, at a larger scale, we can have cultural effects. Uh, we're familiar with Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Uh, for those of us in, in the United States, uh, I didn't know much about Bilbao before this building. Uh, that's maybe for those in Spain, that's, that was very different. But uh, this building and with, and it made, a, a big impression at the time with its first use at, at this scale of titanium panels that reflected the daylight and kind of the sunsets over the river. Uh, you know, this titanium clad kind of gleaming ship like building uh, really uh, put Bilbao on the world map for many people. Uh, and uh, the, the, the number of visitors to the city has gone up dramatically or before COVID, uh, had gone up dramatically, uh, largely because of, of this building, or at least this was the most famous, I think of, of the new cultural monuments in Bilbao. So architecture also obviously has the potential to create these larger cultural effects uh, and, and to influence broader society. And then the most sort of, expansive or the largest potential set of effects uh, that we can have have to do with the environment. And this is just one small view of, of I mean, relatively small project if we're talking about the world here of the Highline Park in New York. But just to say that uh, the, the idea, the approach to uh, to design new uh, 
almost like disruptive green spaces, new kinds of landscapes uh, and pedestrian mobility systems and cities uh, that, that could uh, encourage uh, much better sort of fostering of uh, natural systems, right? Uh, and environmental awareness can be incredibly influential because they can not only be culturally influential, but they hopefully will uh, inspire much better practices and much much better relationship uh, to the natural world. So here's some here's some uh, parting thoughts or, or thoughts to kind of uh, wrap up the talk for further consideration and especially for students and educators as well as practitioners. So if, if you can return to that first slide where I shared my, uh, my studio work on one hand and my building technology class on, on the other hand, uh, I think it's important to mix things up a bit. Again, I'm not aware of, of how you structure those subjects in your university, but at least within the United States, I'm interested in uh, bringing, bringing materials more evidently into some studio settings like we see on the left uh, and, and also bringing uh, innovation into building technology settings so that we're not just learning the rules but students are experimenting with the rules to see what are the edges of the rules? What are the, what are the new possibilities? Because technology is constantly evolving and adapting. Today's rules will not be tomorrow's rules. And so I think it's important that students experiment with, with new systems at a one-to-one -one scale. And these systems can be used to represent uh, larger or scaled phenomena. This is an example of uh, a daylight uh, propagating and filtering system students were designing for the architecture building at the University of Minnesota, working with a, a full-scale prototype uh, of this kind of light chamber with slidable screens uh, at scale. So this this representation on the right was uh, it's uh, roughly a one to twenty four scale uh, representation. But the point is, some phenomena like light can can be experimented with at multiple scales. So you can it's it's helpful for students, especially to understand the impacts of their ideas. And I I think. The idea of material misuse, as strange as it sounds as a recommendation, actually is important for students to experiment with. So for students to purposefully misuse a material. Uh, and I think this particular project designed by the Greek architecture firm, MAB Architecture, the Plinthos project is an, a great example, uh, where they took a brick with, with cores, with uh, voids, in this brick unit and turn the brick on its side. So the image behind me, the image on the right, uh, is this Plinthos installation where the bricks are all turned on their side and backlit with lighting. And so you have strange experience of being in a brick pavilion. And then when the lights are turned on in the back, then you, <laughs> it's the brick, becomes uh, transparent or translucent. Uh, now, misuse has to be done safely, right? You have to make sure we can, the, the structure can uh, bear loads, of course, but I think breaking rules is, is really important to, uh, to teach students and experiment with because we, we have to know how to do that safely. I'll have to explain this. Uh, uh, this was a, a workshop I did with Billy Faircloth, who's uh, a partner at the firm, Karen Timberlake, I mentioned before. So she's the uh, research director of that firm. And we did a workshop with students where they tested invisible strategies in architecture. Uh, 
so they had sensors. They, they were working with Karen Timberlake's wireless network sensor to measure temperature and humidity. And students made models that were thermal, uh, thermally focused models. They were uh, intended in terms of their form and their composition and structure to achieve certain thermal outcomes. And this is, uh, these are some charts that came from their studies uh, and attempts to uh, set thermal goals, invisible goals and achieve them with architecture. But I think this is important uh, to quantify our work as much as is reasonable and appropriate. And especially with climate change, especially with environmental demands on buildings, uh, we need to become better at quantifying uh, those types of outcomes. And I think as, as we teach technology, as we teach history uh, or, or design, it's important to teach change and not just stasis. Uh, so if, if anyone is studying a building in history, like the Empire State Building on the left, uh, just studying one building in isolation doesn't give us the whole picture. Obviously, uh, we need to look at where that project and its technologies uh, and economic basis, et cetera, fit within a trajectory, right? A kind of historical uh, timeline and cultural timeline. I've been fascinated in natural processes like many of us and uh, the idea of emergence as a driving, a driving force. And when possible, we can think of emergence or a kind of generative model of design as one that we would encourage students and others to follow, uh, right? So, and, and the example I give here is, uh, if we were to think about ice as a material, we might first think of it in a cube form because that's often how we either cut it you know, cut blocks of ice or, or uh, form blocks of ice. Whereas there are other processes and other forms of ice, right? Like, like a snow crystal. Uh, and I just think looking at natural models often is great inspiration, right? Great, a great, uh, very humbling point of reference for us as architects to say, oh, I shouldn't just start with my default, you know, first conception of what this material should be but I should look at how natural systems uh, can influence this material. Uh, a cultural point here is to say, uh, now that we're communicating so rapidly and frequently worldwide, we're looking at different practices and co-opting different practices. This is the, uh, um, a method to burn uh, cedar wood uh, called yakisugi that we've seen in Japan. It's become fairly popular now in other parts of the world besides Japan as a way to, uh, uh, to enhance the durability of this material. It's also called shosugi ban. And you've probably seen this, right? And these are some students at the University of Minnesota that are making making uh, a, a panel, a wall for a sauna building out of using this technique. And I, I encourage looking at other cultures, absolutely. Uh, but uh, anytime we do that, we need to look at the deeper cultural implications. Um, it's, it's one thing to borrow a language, but I think we should al always look at where that language comes from and why that language developed where it did. And when we think about technology used uh, evidently in buildings, we often think about uh, digital technology like screens. Uh, the interactive screens on the left are a kind of common uh, technological upgrade that we see in a lot of buildings. Uh, and I'm thinking if, if, we're, if we're designing new buildings to be technologically let's say responsive, right? Or interactive. Simply adding 
screens to a wall is is not it's not very um, I mean it's kind of naive and unsophisticated right it's it's not conceptually very rigorous uh, I think that that the opportunities like McLuhan spoke about with disruptive to new technologies the opportunity is uh, is potentially much broader than we than we think about. So on the right is an image of a Korean from Jampa Sung's project called the Hyper Matrix that creates spaces whose walls are all modifiable uh, via actuators and controllable. So they're projection screens, but they also can create spaces. They can create even furniture and, and rooms and in, in theory, right, and and uh, or storage walls, or <laughs> you know, so you have this kind of it's like uh, bits becoming atoms. You know, you have kind of pixelation of the built environment. It's just one example, but I think it's a much richer, more interesting conceptual approach to technology creating interactive spaces than just putting than just buying a screen and putting it on the wall. As my last slide uh, for today, uh, and, and I'll be happy to take questions. This is, the, I mean, the image could be anything, but this is a, a student project where the students were experimenting with, in, in one of my workshops, uh, with creating building modules that could, that could emit light in the dark uh, with phosphorescent liquids. Because, <laughs> of course, my students like to do crazy things. Uh, but uh, the point really is just to, to kind of wrap up and say that uh, architecture evolves over time, it advances over time based on the ways that we shape it. And in some ways it shapes us, right? Uh, new technologies uh, are become things that we, we soon, uh, just are accustomed to and, and they're second nature to us. And so this, this relationship between uh, society and culture and the uh, built technology is a fascinating one. It's a, it's a continuous transforming one. It never stays fixed. And uh, I think it's important for all of the kind of conservatism about what architecture can be. And, and I, I mean, I have nothing against old buildings. I love, uh, I think anything built with with a certain amount of quality and, and investment should be should be seriously treasured and 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 appreciated. But at the same time, if if we only want our cities to look like old cities, <laughs> we don't we don't want to try anything new. Then architecture can't advance, and so. Uh, I think this is this is an ongoing question for me: is how can architects, how can we become agents and help to uh, position questions for society and uh, to demonstrate new experiments for society in ways uh, that will encourage the right kinds of responses, the right kinds of curiosity and inquisitiveness uh, and delight uh, in the environment. So I will stop my presentation here. Let's see, actually, how do I do that? Oh, up here. <laughs> I've done this before. Okay. okay. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, really, uh, Professor Bronner, for this uh, very inspiring presentation. I mean, uh, I'm sure it's the same case for everyone here, but I was really listening about your different strategy effect of materials, and this is really inspiring to to hear this and and to see it through the through the project you presented to us. Some of us, some of them we knew it, but some of them are really new. So it's really interesting to to hear about it. So thanks a lot again for for this presentation. Um, of course. And I think, yes, I guess some of our uh, participants might have some question for you about uh, 
your work, your presentation, what you showed to us. So please, if you have, I uh, will ask you to open your microphone or tell your name before speaking, please. So Professor Brunel know to whom to speak, or if you <laughs> prefer, you can write directly on the chat. Can I go first then? Yes, of course, Ojan. <laughs> Nobody okay. else is willing uh, to speak. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bronu, for this mm. very uh, mind-opening uh, lecture. I, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, thanks, Matthew, for this opportunity because you made the first contact too. Uh, and my question, I mean, I have a lot of questions. I took a lot of notes here, but I mean, I, I'm trying to organize my mind to, you know, turn them into like more summarized questions, let me say. But, but the one that I really, really uh, wonder is, is, is about this, the, the things that we've been, you know, experiencing for a while with this pandemics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you you, you were uh, in some parts. You were also asking some questions about the uh, educational, let's say, um, perspective that we have in our university. We we rely on uh, hands-on experiences, and we appreciate a lot experimenting and also heuristic methodologies in the studio. But right. I should admit that with this pandemics, uh, almost for a year. Yeah. We're in this, you know, online education environment. And what I find yeah. the most difficult, if you ask me in this educational perspective is to really integrate a material understanding or at least sensitivity to the students, yeah. you know, uh, learning outcomes. I mean, because in this condition, it is really hard to give that feeling of materiality, especially I'm, I'm, I'm the, coordinator of the second year students and you know they almost started because in our first year it's more like basic design rules and the, in in the second year they do first their architectural design project and initiating all these things especially related to materiality in digital environment i find it very difficult we we made some solutions and we tried very hard to be able to give that sensibility but i wonder what is your perspective on that or what are your solutions at least uh thank you very much that's a great question it's a great challenge and definitely one that we're struggling with too. I don't think there are easy answers. Um, I, I had a student recently reach out to me in one of our masters of science programs where uh, there's a summer followed by an academic year of uh, curriculum. So it's, it's, a very, it's a fairly short degree. And the student said, I, I still haven't, been to the architecture building <laughs> and I'm graduating this spring. And so I, I'm, it may be entirely online education. And this is very, uh, very rude awakening for me because I realized that uh, the pandemic has now been long enough that, that we'll, we'll have students that have more, if not all of their education with us online. Uh, which is very sad. So, and and fortunately, we're thinking that this fall we will be in person again, with with most of our students and faculty if we get the vaccine. But to your question, it's a very good question. Uh, there are limited things that we can do. Uh, a studio that I think about, an experience that I think about, uh, is is one where. Uh, Students experiment with materials that are common everyday materials. They're not typical building materials. Um, so I, uh, I taught a studio before the pandemic uh, called Generative Matter. Uh, and I think that this approach isn't, it's not for every studio and it's not for kind of, for maybe uh, typical building materials uh, interactions or experimentation, but I think it's, it could be good for this type of, of circumstance where students are really limited to what they can find at home, uh, or maybe 
could they could order easily uh, in terms of uh, materials that can be accessible. So this studio is one where we uh, we thought about the design process kind of backwards, and we asked students without any building program or site or circumstance to uh, start interrogating common everyday materials. Uh, they looked at wax, so like paraffin wax. They looked at ice. They looked at road salt, like rock salt. Uh, these kinds of things. They looked at uh, some students made uh, homemade bioplastic. Uh, some students made um, uh, something called wood bread that's made from uh, sawdust and they would start to bake these bricks in their ovens. <laughs> so this was before the pandemic, but we found that this studio uh, typically involved uh, uh, or invited students to make things at home anyway. Uh, and they were casting wax and, and ice blocks and doing all kinds of things. And I think it might seem sort of strange to architects that students are experimenting with materials like this but through that process of interrogation, uh, we began, we, we worked with the students to kind of moderate their process and encourage them to ask questions about what can the material do? What could it become? What kind of architectural problem could it solve? Um, and so some students who are, were interested um, in, they were working with um, EVA polymer, kind of wood glue, polymer started to cast these kind of porous blocks that could have acoustic properties and could have tunable acoustic properties. And then they designed uh, ultimately a kind, mm -hmm. of, uh, a kind of installation uh, with certain acoustic, uh, acoustically absorptive capabilities. Just for example, so this, this doesn't really answer your question about a, a, a typical studio or, or the range of uh, material courses or studios that we need to teach right now, but it could be a way um, just just to have students work with everyday materials and available tools at home. Uh, it could be a way to keep students engaged with physical things despite our uh, our situation of being remote. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I wish I could show you images of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I it, mean, was it fun. sounded yeah. it sounded very interesting because you know uh, yeah. I was uh, one of the things that I find also missing in this online education is spontaneity. You know because yeah. you talked about, for instance, I, I found the, that example very very interesting. By the way, uh, the the difference between domestic ice cube and and snow crystal. Oh, yeah. So right, I mean there is a kind kind of a spontaneity you should let to go to be able to you know to to rely on the spontaneity itself, and this is exactly what we cannot find in online education. But I mean yeah. when you say that using the already existing materials or available materials like uh, at hand, at home, that might be a kind of a, I don't know, I cannot say that replacing spontaneity, but at least finding a way for, for unexpected solutions, because when yeah. you work with that material, yeah, that, that, that I found very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thank thanks you. a lot for this answer. I had exactly the same question as I have. I am <laughs> new at the university and I have been hired also to work on material, especially on hands work and workshop. And the pandemic started right at the beginning of my uh, journey in the university. So it has been also a bit yeah. disturbing. So hearing that other possibilities that, of course, I have not taught yet. It was really, it's really good. So thanks a lot for these examples. Um, Absolutely. Yes. I'm just, I'm putting a couple images in the chat um, just because I had them available. Oh. So one is called wood foam. It's a, it's a, where I mentioned briefly, students took uh, waste wood sawdust and found ways to mix it with home, home chemicals. Like, uh, I mean, home, ingredients like uh, baking soda 
and hydrogen peroxide and they made a kind of acoustic uh, type block uh, with this. And then the other one is uh, students were knitting with um, nylon fibers and coating them with bioplastic and created this kind of skeletal planter structure. <laughs> so these are very strange, uncommon experiments uh, that I, I think if it makes sense in one of your courses could could be a way to keep students engaged with everyday materials mm -hmm. but make you know sure. make new things yeah thanks so much yeah um is there any other question i'm sure you have a lot of questions that you would like to ask to <laughs> professor Brunel. so please don't be shy and if you prefer to use a chat please use the chat No. I'm I'm pretty sure that they have a lot of questions, but Hello. sometimes language is a very <laughs> okay. Oh, sure. Yes. Someone Hello, I have a question. Yes, I have a question. My name is Erint. Uh, I'm a research assistant in uh, in Yashar University Architectural Department. And you know, uh, thank you for your very you know uh, good uh, in detail presentation. It was very uh informative uh, uh, since uh in turkey the architectural education is lacking this hands-on experience and uh materiality uh, of the design unfortunately uh, but uh, your uh, presentation i think give very valued valuable uh, information to our students as well and to us as well and uh, my question is um uh, in, in your presentation, you were talking about uh, the, um, you know, uh, what as a designer, uh, what should we aim, you know, as an architect, what should we aim to, uh, should we aim for uh, revolutionary, uh, you know, design solutions or competitive design solutions, you know, to be, yeah, of course, the revolutionary is the uh, is a uh, answer, but I'm thinking about, you know, uh, uh, revolution, uh, revolutionary uh, designs sometimes not uh, <laughs> ends up with revolutionary as uh, as as, uh, as in the you know uh, in the beginning of the phase. So, sh uh, what is your stand on this actually? If I you know uh, direct this question clearly. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, uh, and I think you mentioned the hands-on. Uh, work. I mean, now we're we're certainly not doing much hands-on material yeah. <laughs> work like like we should be and and wish we could. Um, and and the projects I mentioned were not a, a typical studio, but rather kind of experimental ones. So I I think that we can be better at at doing this kind of work at UNC Charlotte, but. Uh, but I would say about, uh, I, think, I think if I understood your question, it's about learning material, like material competencies uh, and, and learning how to be competent with materials versus trying to revolutionize materials, right? Or yes, yes. Use of definitely. materials. Yeah, and I think students, students need, architects need to be competent. We have, it's an incredibly, I mean, the field is very complex. The rules are very complex and uncertain. Uh, for anyone that has, for your first uh, opportunity to work in an architecture field, and when you start interacting with the, the technical architects and engineers in charge of understanding how the buildings are put together, you know immediately how there, there's so much to learn and so much expertise that those individuals have. Uh, so yes, I, I think we need to we need to learn the rules before we can break the rules. Uh, but we will never learn all of the rules because there are so many, <laughs> and there's so <laughs> many, you know, so many different conditions, right, where a, a product or an assembly can be used, and and oftentimes uh, we learn new things about how the rules were inadequate. And so that's, it's, mm -hmm. we'll never know it, all the rules. 
And uh, if that's our, our only goal, then we'll never participate in the advancement of architecture, which invariably requires breaking some rules or trying new things. And so I think that my, my advice would be for everyone to make space in your process to try to break some rules safely, uh, try to misuse some things, try to purposefully uh, do something experimental uh, at some time in your practice. Maybe it's one afternoon a week or, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or maybe one, one kind of crazy idea for, for every project phase or something like that, that you're trying to, just to keep your mind agile. Um, and sometimes I think you might be surprised that some of those crazy ideas might actually be the solution for what you're doing. Um, and, and this has been demonstrated in, in a lot of, uh, you know, the commercial arena, uh, a lot of firms that give their employees space and time to experiment and dream and try crazy things uh, without, without being worried that they'll lose their jobs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like the firm 3M, which is based um, where I used to live in St. Paul, Minnesota was famous for a while of, you know, providing employees time uh, to, to just kind of dream and, and make new experiments. And so I think, I think we all need to do that uh, because if we're only learning rules then we, we, we're not tapping into that creative side and we're not, uh, we're not progressing, but you're right. We have to learn the rules because then we, then we'll understand how significant our departures would be from the rules. Mm -hmm. It gives us context um, once we know more about the rules. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot for it. Yeah. Is there anyone next who want to ask something? Okay, so I had a question in my mind, and uh, it is a type of materials that I mean I start to be very popular right now. That's when we are speaking about reused material, and yeah. in which type of category? What how? What is your thoughts about this uh, new trend or new time of? Type of using this city mining, urban mining, reusing the waste of the city to create new materials. So reused or uh, reprocessed material. It's both types that we can think about. But I haven't seen anything about it in your in your presentation. So how would you categorize this kind of materials? I, I was thinking. That's that's a great question. I mean, in reusing or repurposing waste uh, materials is absolutely an important strategy, uh, and and one that we talked about a lot in my studio when when students were looking at uh, waste sawdust or you know other other materials that are kind of common everyday resources that that are underutilized. So I totally agree with you, Matthew, that uh, this is a very important resource. And there is, I'm opening my web browser now because there's a, uh, what comes to mind uh, immediately is this firm called Otan Studio. That's, yeah. You know this. You know this firm. Yeah, right? yeah they, are, they are in Turkey, and I, I have yeah. in, even invited yeah. them in 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 my class at the end of the semester to, oh, to speak about their yeah. their work. Yeah. Uh, I I had a a fun opportunity recently to uh, ask the founder some questions, and she answered for for. So I I featured this firm in an article in Architect Magazine. I think. Mm -hmm. I think this approach is, is really a, a refreshing and much needed approach is to look at waste, but not, not just any waste, actually to think about uh, how can we reduce our impact as much as possible um, and, to, and to use natural resources and systems uh, 
and and it's absolutely fascinating you know making making building products out of fruit peels and uh, fallen leaves and grass and uh, with with the idea that not all uh, of what we call waste resources are maybe maybe have equal footprints. And so I, I'm inspired by this questioning of uh, any just any natural resource. Well, maybe we shouldn't just use natural resources infinitely because they're even limited, right? We, we can look at how can we reduce our impact even further by these types of materials. And so, uh, absolutely. I think this is, this is incredibly innovative. And I would say this falls within, it can fall within either, either category of approach. Uh, some of these are, some of these might create remarkably new materials that invite new designs, but others might be um, very familiar in terms of their look and feel um, where they they can be used, um, you know, to create designs, you know, to, to replace common materials that we use now. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I mean, this is, this is a great form of innovation and one that invites uh, much, much more uh, activity. And I, I hope that uh, for the students here that, you know, I, I hope that you will uh, engage uh, individuals like this, you know, firms like Otan Studio that are doing this kind of great work and, and try some, try to create some materials like this yourself if possible. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot also for writing an article about Otan Studio because yeah. <laughs> I know them through you. I, I haven't heard about them before and I learned and then when I saw oh. they were in Istanbul, I just directly contact them and they accept very uh, nicely to to come and speak about their oh, work. Oh, good. So, yeah, yeah. Well, when when I can visit your wonderful country, I'm hoping to have maybe I can make a couple of visits. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we will find all the time and possibility <laughs> want to have you f uh, physically here in yeah, our university. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it would be it would be great. Yeah. yeah. To have you here. Uh oh. Thank you. I, I would love it. I'm, sh I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. Izmir is really nice. <laughs> yeah. It looks beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just come in the spring. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Yunus Emre, uh, one of the students. And I'm, I want to ask about the culture. Uh, yeah. What is the role of the culture in, in the perspective of the innovation? What is the role of culture? Yes. Like, we, are we supposed to just ignore all the knowledge or just being revolution or <laughs> keep the, keep the uh, knowledge or how can we value this knowledge or should we just ignore that oh. no that's a great no that's a very very good question uh, culture is is powerful and it's a powerful reality that we can't ignore but uh, so I think we can experiment with cultural, uh, attitudes and approaches like we do with materials. So an example I would give is uh, I was interviewing uh, the architect Jun Aoki. I, I mentioned many Japanese architects because of my time in Tokyo and working on this book called Matter in a Floating World composed of a lot of interviews with contemporary architects and designers. And so I interviewed Jun Aoki um, and he said a very interesting thing about materials. He said that materials have a social code. Uh, and I think it was something like materials have a code, a social code. And so we can operate on that code itself. We as architects can manipulate 
through working with materials, we can manipulate the social code. And I think what he was implying is that uh, the, the changes that we make with materials in terms of how we apply them, how, how they're expressed, have cultural implications. And he's very interested in those implications of how society would interpret his architecture by manipulating the code of what's expected culturally through the materials. And so I think, I agree. I think, uh, I think sometimes when we want to experiment, we should ignore temptations to conform just because we don't want to upset anybody. Sometimes we have to ignore that temptation, but I don't think we should ignore this social code. I think actually it's an area of tremendous opportunity for people uh, because it's, I think you have, to, you have to have some ability to anticipate how different audiences will respond to your work. I think that is very important uh, and to anticipate maybe how different audiences might be surprised or interested in, in the work is important. You may not create work that everyone loves if you try, once you're experimenting, there will always be uh, people that don't like it. <laughs> you know? But, but, uh, but I think, no, I think it's important to be aware of culture, very important. And, and how different audiences will respond. And some will be delighted, some will be very intrigued and curious. Thanks a lot. Does it answer your question, uh, you know, Sam Ray? Yes, Ojan, thank you. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of globalization, uh, all the cultural uh, identity, all the nations, uh, shifted and uh, you know uh, we are talking about innovation and it uh, really confuses me because culture in the culture is the way of our acting uh, the view of our own nation in, to the world and when you see, when you try to uh, new something, you should break the old one. And mm. you cannot decide uh, what you are supposed to keep it and what you are supposed to break it. Hmm. I think when, when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about how cities change over time and uh, and decisions we make to keep certain monuments or, um, or perhaps to adapt certain structures in certain ways to preserve them or to change them, which is a really fascinating phenomenon. Uh, I don't think there are any right answers. Uh, and especially with the complexities of culture. And I, I think it's, it's important that architects are very attuned to culture and be very receptive to culture. Uh, and, and of course, cultures change wherever you go and architects often do work um, in places outside of their hometown. And so it's, it's, it's very challenging to be sensitive to all those forces and understand all those forces. I don't, I don't think there's a right answer. I think we just do our best uh, to understand and appreciate and study and respect cultures wherever we're working. Uh, and, and I think if we go in with respect and try to listen as well as we can and try to cooperate and collaborate with local uh, with local colleagues, let's say on a building project, then we're, we're doing the best that we can. We may not always make the best decisions, uh, but, but I, I think that's an interesting aspect of an architectural education is that we really need to be very attuned and very culturally sensitive. Uh, and it, that's perhaps something that we can add to our architectural study 
we can have more of is, is understanding of, of different societies and cultural responses uh, to the built environment. Thank you, John. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation also. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can thank you a lot again, Professor Bruno, oh. for this time you spent with us on all these thoughts you shared with us. It was really, really good. And I'm sure we have all learned something as nobody else seems to be ready to ask anything anymore. <laughs> we really Let me... th thank you. And please let you have a conclusion of this uh, meeting. Thank you so much, Matthew. And, and I put my uh, email in, in the chat for everyone. So please, I welcome you to be in contact. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to speak with you on the other side of the world. Uh, it's, it's very reassuring at a time that has so much uncertainty and and where we're distant from one another uh, to be able to make connections. And so I, I hope we can keep, keep the connection and I wish you the best of luck in your, in your uh, semester. And hopefully we can meet each other one day in person. Really, really, really great. Yeah, really we, hope to. To. <laughs> we hope to, we hope to. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. And have a good, have a good day then since it's the beginning of the day for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Have a good night. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.